Hey guys. We're doing Wednesday lesson of the day early today on Thursday because I have a couple minutes between consults, which is fantastic. And I wanted to go over what I was gonna talk about last week but didn't get to, and it's really how to optimize healing after a facelift surgery. And um, there are many things that you may not think about. The first obvious thing is don't be a smoker. And I'm on this chat group uh, on WhatsApp where the surgeons share some nice details about how to treat people, patients, and improve their outcomes and ask questions. And one of the questions was, what do you do with a smoker? And one of the more wise uh, older surgeons said, I don't treat smokers because smokers are addicts and addicts are liars and we have trouble treating them because of this. Now. Um, we obviously do treat smokers, but it's important to kind of uh, understand that smokers are addicts and they do have problems with stopping smoking and that can lead to many issues with smoking itself and with just the pattern of behavior of telling people what they wanna to hear to keep doing what you wanna do. Um, in surgery, that's a terrible idea. You always wanna relinquish control completely to the doctor and uh, at least for the first few weeks where uh, so many things can happen that you'd be unaware of. So that's the first thing I'd say for smokers is you do have to just give up completely for the first couple of weeks. And ooh, Hande from Istanbul. Sorry we're not coming. Didn't work out, but I'm going to come soon anyways. And um, the that's one major thing is really that you have to be as honest as possible with the surgeon because many things can happen that you're unaware of and they can see it right away and keep bad things from happening. And the other is what problems can you actually have from smoking? Smoking is harmful because it can cause vascular issues, meaning you can have poor blood supply and uh, skin can just die off. So you're doing this whole surgery to make the skin and the face healthier, but you can actually kill the skin by smoking immediately after or around surgery. Now that's not as common with deep plane lifts as other issues, but it still is possible. The main issue you see, and the biggest issue that you would see is pigmentary issues. And this is a realistic problem that you see with smokers around any kind of surgery is that their inflammatory response is exaggerated, their hormonal response is exaggerated, and they end up getting pigmentary change in all the areas where skin was elevated, whether that was the side of the face, the lip, the eyes, or anything like that. Uh, so that's the main thing. And once that happens, it is super difficult to fix because it came from smoking, which is an incredibly inflammatory uh, issue. The other is pets. So pets are wonderful. I'm a dog lover. I like cats too. I like chinchillas. I like everything. Um, you love cats. We have a cat lady here. Hedia loves cats. She's actually, you're one cat away from being a cat lady. It takes three actually to become a cat lady. From two away. Yeah, you're two away, but you look like you're at two already. You look like a cat lady. So uh, cats and dogs, uh, as amazing as they are, there is this fallacy, meaning uh, a myth that's out there that dogs' mouths aren't dirty. Um, maybe when you compare it to a human who's been taking antibiotics their whole lives, it's got less aggressive bacteria, but certainly there is bacteria in the mouth of every animal and under their claws and everything. And normally, yes, we live with this bacteria and we live with bacteria on our skins and you should certainly not be a germaphobe. We live with bacteria as part of our biome. However, after surgery, you have these wounds uh, that are open and dogs and cats are very caring creatures and they have some kind of magnetism towards your wounds or a wounded owner and they or friend, whatever you want to call yourself. Uh, and they magnetize and they come and not only hit things just like kids would so kids will not if you have a nose job a, Your kid your child will hit you in the nose. This is very common um, But dogs like to lick things and sleep next to you on the bed and uh, there have been reports very commonly of infections from doggy doo-doo so dog caca dog poo-poo and How does this happen? Well the bacteria is around and that bacteria if you're sleeping next to your dog or the dog is putting his little butt on your pillow that you sleep on can actually pass to your incisions and in a normal real life scenario where you're not you haven't had surgery this isn't a big deal uh, who cares about bacteria you can have bacteria all over the place and you should however um, 
cats and dogs can pass these things. You can get uh, Toxoplasma, you can get Bartonella, which uh, would usually come from a cat, and you can actually get fecal bacteria, so imagine like an E. coli type thing, but that are just carried by dogs. So all of these things can happen, which just means um, for the first three weeks, I know you love your dogs and your cats, but just take it easy. And the three weeks is really essential. Same goes from, uh, same goes for the smoking and things like that. So those are the main things we tell people to avoid perioperatively. The other would be in LA, I always ask patients, are you taking turmeric, cayenne pepper, curcumin? And so patients from other countries laugh at that question because they say, what do you mean? Uh, in LA, there's something going on with the connections today. So in LA, it's a very common thing that they take way too much turmeric, curcumin, and cayenne pepper, which is very heart healthy, uh, but they take it around surgery and they end up bleeding a ton. So we ask patients, please don't take those for two weeks before. Don't take aspirin, don't take Advil. Another thing that we see is patients like to go to quacks. A quack is a doctor who has some kind of certification, but is nobody that we would respect in the real world of medicine nor intelligence. And quacks, I've talked about this in other uh, Wednesday lesson of the day lectures, so I won't belabor this, are doctors who typically prescribe, uh, not in all cases, but prescribe the human growth hormone, the testosterone, the uh, estrogen and things like that when you don't need it. So to an otherwise healthy person, they read some kind of lab, which I don't understand how they read it, and they would say, your testosterone is low. And then they give you testosterone and you're like, wow, I feel great. However, they don't go over the possible risks of you dying earlier and getting atherosclerosis and increased rosacea and hair loss. And the same doctor would actually give you testosterone. Your hair starts falling out, then they give you finasteride, which reverses the increase in testosterone uh, activity. So those are quacks. Um, there are lots of those in this world. There are mainly located here in LA uh, because they make lots of money off of anti-aging. So. Um, they're not endocrinologists and uh, they don't really have long-term data on what this stuff does to you negatively. But one of those things is lots of bleeding. So people who take a lot of that testosterone and uh, HGH and those kind of things, I don't know the mechanism behind it. I've heard it discussed, but they, they bleed like stink. And I had one of the worst bleeders ever the other day. Controllable, it's always controllable in facelifting, but uh, certainly makes things harder and higher risk. So you really want to be off of things and uh, patients want to be proactive. The only proactive thing you need to do is let your body be in a natural state of equilibrium. So don't introduce new things, don't take extra things, let your body normalize and naturalize and be in a calm state where it can heal the best. You don't want to take anti-inflammatories because that's going to make you bleed more. However, afterwards, if you need them after a week, you can take those things. Um, so, and good morning to Ashley. And uh, that's the lesson for that. So the other question I had already today was uh, about fissures in the mouth. And I want to talk about those because nobody knows how to deal with those. So fissures in the mouth are these tiny little like resting bitch face downturn corners that you get where there's no real skin. It turns into a uh, stretch mark. And when you have those stretch marks, no matter what you do in terms of lasers, radio frequency, you can't get rid of them. Even if you try to burn them completely off because there's no real existent dermis underneath. And in those cases, you may as well get rid of the stretch mark by cutting it out and putting the skin back together. However, it's not the most benign procedure. You do have to follow up later with doing little bits of injection of filler to stimulate it and then doing laser on top of that. So those fissures are really, really difficult. To maintain this, you have to do Botox, Dysport, Xeomin, whichever one you want. We call them neurotoxins or neuromodulators. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. You call them homeless or houseless, whatever you want to call People, it's the same thing, neuromodulator, neurotoxin. Uh, these are semantics that do not matter in this world. So you can call it whatever you want, as long as you put them down here. And you put a few units over here and it keeps your mouth from pulling down and getting the resting bitch face, but also keeps it from exaggerating those fissures. Um, if you do a lip lift, it may exaggerate the fissures. So realize if you bring up the middle side, looks like it's relatively farther down. And if you do a corner lift, you usually improve them, but not always, and a corner lift is just make an incision over here on the side of the mouth to get rid of some of the weight on the mouth and neutralize it. So that's that. I think I was gonna mention one more thing, which is pores on the face. Pores are interesting things to understand. If you look at my face, you'll see tons of pores. Um, I'm totally kidding. So, but there are pores on you know people's faces, and um, 
pores get bigger over time because they are uh, pilosebaceous appendages where you have either hair follicles or sebum or sweat coming out of these things and over time they can either get thicker, deeper, more prominent and they're very difficult to treat. The number one way, easy way to treat them over time has always been Retin-A. It doesn't do that much but it helps increase uh, skin cycles and um, decrease the appearance of it just a little tiny bit but more recently we've been getting better and better with radiofrequency treatments and the more impressive one that I've seen which Jen, I think you'd probably agree, is the matrix, uh, profound matrix. Here's Jen over here. She just walked in. She's supervising Hedia to make sure <laughs> Hedia is not causing trouble. Um, never trust somebody with dimples. Or we pores. Made, or pores. Or we made, we, made, we made this mistake. We made this mistake. Um, also, don't get dimple surgery. I think we've talked about that. Don't get dimple surgery. Um, it's not a natural thing to do. Uh, please don't get dimple surgery. It's it's a strange surgery. And if a surgeon does it for you, they're probably a little bit weird too. Um, just don't do dimple surgery. If you naturally have it, you have it. Uh, so back to the pores. If you want to make pores smaller, it's very difficult to do. However, these superficial radio frequency treatments can be fantastic. And you just have to know the depth at which to go at and to go low energy. So it does not help you to do high energy on pores, uh, high energy or high fluence or high joules per square centimeter, whatever you want to look at it as, um, can actually worsen things. And you don't want to get any atrophy. You want to keep the volume behind the pores. So if you use a superficial radio frequency, the best two are Morpheus and Matrix. Uh, we have the Matrix, which is from Profound, and then Morpheus is from InMode. Both very good treatments, and you can do superficial depths which means 0.8 to 1.2 and then 1.8 millimeters. And that'll give you both superficial dermal epidermal and then uh, deep dermal or reticular dermis improvements, which is where you want the improvements for these pores because the pores extend down into the deeper part of the dermis and even past the dermis into the hypodermal fat. Uh, so you want to hit all that area without melting the fat. The fat is usually on most parts of the face uh, about two millimeters. And yes, today is Kylie Jenner's birthday. We should celebrate. This is a, it's a good note. So um, that is all. Do you have any other tips for pores, Jen Hollander? The quickest way to minimize the visibility of pores is to get rid of your moisturizer. Oh. Your conventional moisturizer. Because yeah. more oil, more pores. It accentuates the appearance of the pores. Agreed. Which is why Retin-A works so well. Yes. And don't cake <laughs> makeup on. It's yes. terrible. There's not... Guys don't like it. So don't put, yeah, they cake makeup on. Like, tinted moisturizer's okay. You know, those are nice. Tinted moisturizer's fine. But the concealers and the, whether they're creamy concealers or powder concealers, it's too much. You wanna show the natural glow of your skin that looks healthier, it looks sexier, it looks younger. Um, sort of like this. Esther, can I see your face for a second? Um, come up close here. <laughs> oh, can no, you, please, please. <laughs> no, the whole point is no makeup. There you go. Yeah, the kissy face helps. Thank you. Um, so if you see, natural is is, is better. Fantastic. All right. Any questions here? Let's see. Let's see if we have any questions. Nobody ever puts questions in the question box. But um, all right. When do you do another giveaway? When somebody finds me, Mel Brooks. You find me, Mel Brooks. I'll give you what you want. So that's uh, that's the only thing coming up. Um, we will have an event soon for Cupid Lips, which is opening hopefully by the end of the month, Sunset Plaza, and that'll be more of a party than anything, but I'm sure we'll give away some fun things just to make it exciting. And I think we got everything. Fantastic. I will post this for everybody if there's any questions, let's pose them on the next one down here in that little question box. Oh, now there's questions on there. Okay, talk lip lift, here we go. Well, a lip lift will be a separate one, we'll do that later. How often do you do surgery on submandibular glands after a facelift from another surgeon? On revisions, I actually do it more often because they've removed usually some midline fat, and this is a lesson for all surgeons is that when you do surgery, we are doing them on patients laying down. So you artificially have an improvement in the lateral compartments, which be your, your submandibular triangle pops back into the floor of the mouth. And when you sit them up, it 
comes into sense. So when you're operating, you should actually uh, really, really be cautious not to take midline. However, most surgeons go in and the first thing they do, and I'm talking about 90% of surgeons in the world, is take away midline. And when they come visit, it takes me saying 10 times in a row, don't take midline fat 20 different ways and then doing the surgery and then repeating myself until they fully get it. Uh, so this is the most common mistake people make and why submandibular glands look prominent. Number one is because they take midline and they say, oh, you mean over resection of midline? I say no, any resection of midline. Anytime you resect midline, you're now committed to decreasing the lateral compartments a disproportionate amount to keep them higher and this lower because once you close the platysma back up, it has a trapdoor effect and exaggerates it even more. So um, that's how you pre uh, prevent it. I gave a whole lecture, which we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna have one next Sunday for our uh, St. Louis group. And I will talk about the need for submandibular gland reduction or not need for something. And so I played this game in San Diego uh, during the last lecture where I put up photos and I said, you guys have to guess. I ruined the guessing because I just had no time. So I just had to like, you know, uh, say the answer. But um, we had them guess which photo before and after had some mandibular gland reduction and which didn't. It's pretty much, uh, you can't tell. So. Um, the answer to that is most people do not need some mandibular gland reduction. However, it does benefit some people. So we still do it. I do it. I like doing it. Um, but it does take more time, causes more swelling and that kind of stuff. So you don't just do it willy nilly. Do you treat acne scars? Yes, we do. And we do active acne to calm it down. There's medications we can use topically, uh, creams we can use topically. We can use the Avi Clear which is a laser that diminishes the size of the glands that exaggerate acne, and then we can actually do acne scarring and things like that. Nothing gets rid of acne 100% because it's very damaged skin, but you can get massive improvements, and uh, we have tons and tons of those that Jen does over here and Taylor does, and um, they're really wonderful treatments. So yes, we do lots of that, and that's actually probably their specialty amongst all else. Um, PDO threads or Morpheus for lifting gels? Well, PDO threads for nothing. Morpheus, fantastic. Uh, I use Profound to tighten up the gels. It works better than Morpheus or Matrix. Uh, Morpheus and Matrix typically work better for superficial skin quality improvements with less downtime. Cancer treatment, ravish my face. Now I'm uh, saggy now. Yes, that does happen, unfortunately, after chemotherapy more than anything and typically you wanna start with nanofat PRP treatments to rejuvenate the subdermal tissues before doing anything else and make it healthier and wait for your body to equilibrate, which after cancer treatments probably takes up to three to five years. So it does take a long time for it to equilibrate afterwards, but it does accelerate aging tremendously for the hair and for the face. The hair can actually change color. Uh, it can get thinner, it can fall out, a bunch of other things can happen. And just as the hair sheds, the skin sheds differently after chemotherapy treatments. Is there a good laser for vertical lip lines around the mouth? Yes, nothing fully fixes it, so it's like throwing everything in the kitchen sink at it. You have to do rejuvenation treatments with hydration, uh, laser, radio frequency, you can do all those things. Fantastic, okay, we'll call it a day. I will post this and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thursday. I will be uh, in the Redneck Riviera. If you need me, you'll find me in South Carolina on a boat.